Um, Paddy Hill, so I um, got a bit of a buyer there. It's been about um, six months now I've been working uh, with Box Hill Hawk, so um, yeah, it sort of came about when I lost my job at Franks and the club went under. Um, it was two pretty tough years at Franks and no resources, uh, no staff. Um, you know, we're a very young playing group, we're just starting to get somewhere and uh, unfortunately the club, the club went under, well, they're still fighting. Yeah, I, um, they're still fighting to exist, but we certainly lost our, our VFL license and then I, uh, I got a call from Hawthorne and saying that they wanted to start up the female side and would I be interested? I went and met with them and uh, they sold me the vision and having worked at Box Hill before I knew what sort of club they were. Um, I, I sort of took about two hours, I think, to make up my mind and accept the position, which was, which is great. And um, I'm, I've got a wife and I've got a 9 year old daughter and I've got four sisters that range from 41. My sister is my oldest one and my youngest one is two. Um, that's another story, but uh, <laughs> not probably not for today. But, um, but I get a great sense of pride already in doing this job. Um, and in, in a short time I've become uh, really passionate about it and I'm really enjoying working with the group I've got. I'm enjoying um, the connections you can form with your players. Um, it's certainly a lot easier, they say all coaches fall in love with their players. Um, I don't mean that in a, any other sense, but the, you know, that genuine love of your players. And it's, very, it's a lot easier with women to show that affection and emotion that you have for, for your group than it is with guys and we, we like to be a bit standoffish and a bit bullish, but you can, you can say, you know, I'm really proud of you, I really love what you're doing and they, they really appreciate it. So it's been a great six months so far. Um, that's my team out there, uh, heading out for their first game last week down at Simmons Stadium and um, it was quite interesting because we had a few girls there, the, 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 the larger girl on the, on the right hand side, it's her first game of proper footy and she's playing at Skilled Stadium and the girl with the blonde hair on the far side to her, it's her first game of footy, she's come from, I think both came from netball, Mel Keys in the middle, she's a uh, common player for the AFL uh, and then behind is uh, uh, a bit of a motley crew from all over the place, all different divisions, um, all different sports. We've got a, we've got someone from field ho hockey, who you'll see later in the presentation. Um, we had a frisbee player, uh, someone who's doing, doing really well. Um, but yeah, they've sort of come from all over, all over the eastern suburbs, um, all just looking for opportunity. Um, so just what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to try and keep it... Um, it's about my observations and what I've learned over the six months and, and, and pretty much when you're, when you're doing it at this level, um, you, you probably live, eat and breathe it. I don't really have much spare time. Um, I'm in either at Box Hill or Hawthorne you know, pretty much five days a week. Um, I may get one afternoon off to myself and go and see the family. Um, but it gives you a lot of time to think about what it means to coach women. So I'll go through my observations and just a bit of the differences between men and coaching men and women, what I break that down into four different areas. And then it's going to talk about skill development and obviously kicking will come up as, a, as an issue um, with, with females. So how I've gone about coaching, I've got one girl who's a, who's a uh, pentathlete and she comes with our, our try a day and the most amazing runner you've ever seen and we were just blown away by how physically fit she was, how strong, um, sharp, Germany, and I said to one of the assistant coaches, gee, I hope she can kick. <laughs> and then we got to training, and I've never seen anything like it. It was the, the most horrible sight I've ever seen in my life, and I was shattered. I went home that night and cried. <laughs> but we retained, and I said, my well, words to her was that, you know, your skill level doesn't matter at the moment, we have just got to work on it. So we, we had an extensive tryout, and she didn't make the list, I think she started in November, didn't actually officially go over our list until uh, nearly April. And in that time, she did a lot of work on her kicking. So I'm just going to take you through how we went about turning people that had never kicked before uh, in, to be able to kick. And, and some of them are doing really well now. Um, just finished probably five tips, my top five tips for coaching females. Um, and then any questions you've got for me at the end regarding women's sport and um, time left over for that, ask me that you want. All right, so. Just to start with, um, difference between coaching men and women. I've had a lot of people and a lot of media ask me, uh, you know, what's it like coaching women? You know, uh, is it better or worse than coaching men? My standard answer is, it's the 
it's not better or worse, it's just different. So I think though, for the large part, a lot of it's the same. Right? A lot of it's the same. We don't, it's not as far apart as we think, but there are some, some differences there. So what and, and there's some obviously some experience this year. What might be some of the differences between coaching men and women? Or boys and girls? Understanding that they've got, so boys tend to pick up the foot too, and women don't pick it up now until years later. Yeah. So the understanding is that they're kind of the ball and yeah. stick around and so. So that intrinsic ability to naturally do it without thinking. So if you think about the scale of learning, the goal, a lot of the guys are in unconsciously skilled for any. Girls, um, I've got there some there that, you know, what are they, uh, Mark? <coughs> Right, so we look at um, scale of learning. Um, so you start off and you're un unconsciously unskilled. Right, so that's where you don't know you haven't, you haven't got a skill, you don't, you don't even know. Um, and I like to talk, when I'm talking to our players about this, I like to talk about video games. So when you get, you want to play video games over the years, if you get your first video game, it looks easy, you start to play it, you, real, you, you don't even know you can't play. This, that looks easy, I'll do it. You're down this area here. Then, over here, you become conscious, but you're still unskilled. So that's where you go, okay, I'll start this, and you go, geez, this is harder than it looks. All right? From there, you start to become skilled on this side, so you're skilled, right? but you're really conscious of what you're doing. So you go, okay, now I can do it, but I push A, and now I've got to go across, and I push B, so you know how to do it, but you've got to think about it. And then the last stage is where you're skilled and unconscious. When you're in this zone here, it's when you're playing the mate and you're talking and, you have, and your mum comes in, yeah, just making some of this, and your hands are just going in. So guys, a lot of the guys we coach, yeah, they pretty much live in this area here. All right? Sometimes that can be dangerous because they're not actually thinking about what they're doing and they're not, you know, they think, I oh, know, I can just do this. Um, so floating in between these two is probably really good. When you get back into here, you're challenging yourself. But the girls certainly, um, a lot of mine started here, so look at the heptathlete, she was here. Um, she's moved up into this section and she's starting to, starting to turn the beam down and get to where she needs to be. So that's a really good point. What else? I find with the juniors, of course, they just a competitive spirit. They're not as guys that tend to want to be better than his mate. Yep. The girls are more worried about like, who's going to you know, go first or who's going to be last. Yep. Good so point. That can put in some spirits. Good point. And obviously, when we're, when we're talking about this, we're, we're generalising a little bit. Because yeah. I've got some girls that are extremely competitive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I've got some girls that are exactly what you say, and there's no competitiveness there. But if you look at a whole, uh, you're right, guys are trying to outdo each other all the time. Right. And, and girls, there is a sense of fitness <coughs> about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, the classic is when you're on the line. Guys will just cut in front of you. You're not looking, they'll cut in front of you because yeah. they want another touch and they want to look better than you. Girls are like, come on, it's your turn. It's, you make sure you go. Right? But yeah, there are there's definitely some competitive ones, especially in, in the VFL. They're, they're very competitive. Yes, uh, there is. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Maybe they commun the way they communicate with each other is different. Yes, definitely. Compared to adolescent boys. Sorry? Compared to adolescent boys. Yep. Yeah. In what way do you see that? Um, that sometimes things are taken maybe the, not the way they meant. Some of the boys don't bat an eyelid to things. Yeah, I find and what I found, um, typically we went through a long process of selecting our squad. We started with 150 and worked that down to 40. Um, when I've coached guys before, they generally all every single guy over 150 would think they're in the 40. And they're not concerned at all about their place, even though they might be right out there, no, I'm right. And that ego takes control. I think I've found with the girls that you need to reassure them with that and they want to know. And they, they, they don't think, none of them think they're in the 40. They always think someone else is in there ahead of them. So they want, they like that reassurance. Um, so I think that's, that's a definite I've noticed. So the ego is a big factor. There's a big difference between guys and girls. Yeah. Uh, just with my playing group, Found the girls to be really compliant, yep. and uh, really willing to learn, and really yep. keen to learn. And yep. I guess looking at that graph you've got lying there, uh, you know they're in the top region there. They yeah. don't think that they know it all, so they're really, yep. they're really willing to learn. 
extremely, extremely appreciative of any efforts to coach and develop them. Well, they have the two boys that don't know some players in there or pushing each other over and kicking each other. And, you know, it's just, I mean, they're very good at it, but, yeah. uh, you know, they don't listen to the coach and they suppose they listen three times. It's just, yeah. You know. It's a good point. I'll raise something of that later. You know, what about the similarities? For me, there's, there's a lot of similarities. <coughs> some of the similarities you can see. They all want to perform. Yeah, they all want to, they all want to perform. Okay, yeah. They all want to be good players. They're all they're all motivated to, to um, be the best player they can be. I don't have any I don't see any difference there. They all love the game. The all the girls that I've, I've got there, they really, really love the game. There's no doubt about their passion for the game of AFL footy. And that comes out every training session and, and every you know, it's been, it's been great, this process of going through the first game and then the first game at home and we had a jump of presentation. There's been a lot of tears, there's been a lot of emotion, almost to the point that, you know, we want to, we still want to get past that now and just play footy. But you get to see how much it means to them to have this opportunity. So, definitely. Do you think that stage is going to Because I've been around the gap for five years. Yeah. And the emotion's still there. Yeah. It's never That's been right. left. That's yeah. great. And the tears are still there. Do you yeah. think it'll leave your club because you're really I hope hard? not. <clears throat> I hope not. Yeah. Because that's why we do these things we play sport. Um, and that's the joy I get out of being a coach, is that emotional connection with the players to make people try and make people better. And that's what's the great thing about it. So if they remain if this women's footing remains emotional, and it may take maybe it takes two generations and then all of a sudden it becomes, yeah, okay, we've got a competition there, that's our birthright. But at the moment women are still very much appreciative of this opportunity, they probably never thought they were going to get. So every young girl coming through for the next one or two generations, I think, will be excited and be emotional, and that's great. All right, so I was going to go through four different areas of things that I've noticed, um, and some of the, the differences, and again, this is not better or worse, it's just differences. So uh, anatomical, smaller hands, uh, smaller bones, hands and feet. So the smaller bones plays a part in flexibility right, and their rate of injury. They're more rounded on the end of their bones is why they can be more flexible. Smaller hands and feet, how does that, what does that matter in the footy? Grip on the ball. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ball handling and purchase on the kick as well. Right, so it is a factor. It's a factor. All these are things that we need to take into consideration. Uh, women are more flexible. Men are 30% stronger than women on average. Women are wider in the pelvis. This is a really important one. So wider in the pelvis. So if you look at, um, I can't draw a pelvis, but I'll just draw a square one. Men's, uh, is this a femur? Tends to go down like this and then into their knees like that. Women's come in like that. Right, so when it actually puts more strain on the knees because of the angle of the femur coming down there. So they're, Something like 50, 40, 40 to fifty percent more prone to doing an ACL. We've had two this year at our club already. All right, so um, that shouldn't stop them playing. It's some things we need to do. Uh, and prehab is really, really important for females in sport. So um, I'd, I'd look at rollers, um, making sure they go through all that sort of stuff. Their core strength, stretching, all that sort of stuff. Um, before they play, and make sure that becomes part of their routine. Men have larger lungs, okay, so more capacity to get air in, which will, when they get oxygen in, turns um, your lactic acid into triphosphate, which then can use your muscles again. Um, so that's a factor. Women have a lower blood pressure, but have uh, faster heart rates. Men's hearts are bigger than females. All right. Uh, none of that there is catastrophic. To being able to play, it's something we've got to think about. When we think about game plan, how we go about it, how we go about our training, um, what our expectations are, of what uh, a female can do in the field, it, it has to come into our thinking. All right, mindset. Women ask more questions. Women actually absolutely ask more questions. Men sit in a room, looking at the ceiling. They know it already. You don't. You can't tell them anything. Uh, women listen, listen more, and ask more questions. No doubt about it. Six months I've had with the girls, 
That's all I get is questions. That's great because they challenge your thinking. If I say something one week, two months later I say something slightly different, contradicts that, they will remember it and they'll bring it up. Right? They constantly ask me questions. Uh, need reassurance regularly, we spoke about that a little bit. They do need reassurance. Um, they need, they like to know where they're at. As I said, men think they're in, women aren't sure and they want you to tell them exactly where they're at. They crave feedback, um, they want to play with a friend. So what we found, even at an elite level, women don't pick money or success over friends. <clears throat> it's really important females that they play with their friends. So if we're thinking about recruiting, what we'd normally do to recruit a guy doesn't work with women. But they want they want to play with friends. They will travel past two clubs if their friends play there. Men, see you mate, we're a hundred bucks more down the road. Right, they'll, they'll go straight away. Um, we found that women really appreciate personal coaching. They're very appreciative. Um, if you can show genuine care and hope to develop, it, develop everyone on your list, um, they'll be so appreciative and they let you know. Whereas guys in there, oh, thanks, thanks coach, but they really let you know. So that's been great. Uh, passion's strong, but it's not the end of the world. So I said before, women really love the game of footy. And there is passion about the game, um, as any guy I know. But to them, I think the playing side and getting to AFL is not the end of the world like it is for some guys. So if family has to come first, it'll come first. They'll straight away they'll put their priorities in order and say, not nah, family first, and they'll go. Um, spoken to a lot of coaches and local and some of the reasons why they've missed games, you know, friends, friends got this on, friends got a baby shower on, I have to go to that. So to them, Getting those priorities, while they love the game, it's not always about playing the game and they'll push everything else aside. So, as a coach, I've got to think about that too and say, well, just because I, I think you should be here and the guys will be here at Rain, Hail or Shine, I've got to sort of put myself in the mind of these girls and say, okay, what are their priorities? It might not be mine, but we have to be understanding of that. And we think we spoke before about netball and how we've got other sports that are colliding with a lot of women's sports because they haven't had this opportunity before. They're already entrenched in other clubs. Um, we've got a girl, Chantelle Pereira, who's a VBL basketballer. She was, uh, sorry, Siebel. She was uh, WNBL. Um, and she plays for both now. So she misses some training, she misses some games. I've got to be understanding that because while she really wants to make it, she's going great guns, it's not everything to her like it might be to me. All right, training habits. Like to have fun while they train, but they don't skylark, in my observation. So, I, the girls I've got, and talking to some other coaches again, they love to have fun. But I never feel like it's a distracting type of time. If I go out there though and try to be all serious, like I would with a bunch of guys, or, and start you know, yelling and screaming, it, they're gone. I'm going to lose them. They like to have some fun with it. So it's it's about being clear, it's about being open and honest about how they're going. At the same time, you, you need to have a bit of fun in there. But I never find that they cross the line where it's really distracting the group. And you spoke before about young guys pushing each other over. And I know with uh, even with Frankson at VFL level, at times if you let them go too far, just they skylark and muck them around, and not listening to words you're saying. And I haven't found that with the girls, but certainly an element of fun. Well, this one here, they like to do things right, but at lower intensity. So, what I find with the girls, every time you explain a drill, they go out there and they have the ball and they, they're looking at you. Am I kicking over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's so they, they turn and they, oh, yeah, and they kick it there. And then the next girl's in the chase. I'll get it. I'll, I'll get it. Guys will go out, they don't listen to the thing you say, they don't listen to the drill. I'll go out a million miles an hour, they don't care if they're doing it or not, they're just going to have a kick in the foot. Right, so with the girls, it's about, I think, the time to say, all right, it's okay to make mistakes, go out and do it, a bit more intensity, make some mistakes along the way, that's okay, that's we develop. With guys, it's more guys settle down, a bit lower pace first, and then get it sort of semi right, and then we'll coach it. 
And it really is a different mindset. So the girls are more constantly saying, more intensity, the girls more intensity. I find that they don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to do it wrong. They want to do it right the first time. Now that doesn't always happen, but I find the rate of improvement from the start of a drill to the end of a drill in 10 minutes time is far greater than what it is with guys. Guys, it's three times doing the drill, and all of a sudden they're going to start to get it right. Great intensity. Girls, it's low intensity, get it right, and then you've got to keep working on the intensity to get it up. Competitiveness, competitiveness we've spoken about, and aggression. Um, particularly with girls that come from other sports, um, you've got a lot of athletes, uh, runners, getting them to be aggressive with each other has been a challenge. Uh, getting them to tackle, and, you know, it's okay to hurt someone at training, you know, you've got to get in there. Um, and we spoke a bit about the different priorities. So, again, with training, you know, they'll miss training for things that guys would never miss training for. But generally, their feedback to not coming to training is a lot better. So they're not going to be there. Pretty much every night, I can account for everyone. No one just doesn't come and doesn't ring. And we've all been involved in men's footy. Half your team you can't account for. And then you ask the next one, oh, yeah, work late. Not to work late, so. Certainly different. All right, skill level. So kicking not yet intrinsic, coming back to your point. It's not a natural thing to do yet with a lot of them. Issues with ball drop. Um, that comes a little bit back to hands, not having held a footy before. And I remember having Lindsay Gilby um, do some kicking stuff on one of the courses I did. And he said, you should be able to throw the ball up, catch it without looking, and turn the ball around in your hands so that the laces are out. And most guys can do that. Right? Girls don't quite have that yet. They quite haven't got that feel. Where they position their hands is a little bit wrong. Um, we tend to hold a little bit high and a little bit flat. We'll go through that in a sec. Um, but that is certainly an issue. Uh, marking issues. So marking again uh, on the chest is okay at times, but getting it out here and having the streak to hold onto that ball slapping into the hands is a bit of an issue. Game knowledge, all right, um, and composure. So game knowledge. I think let's, if we look at over the last um, in the history of women's sport, a lot of the a lot of the really good coaches and um, go where the money is. Would you agree with that? It's where the money is. That's where the good coaches go. There hasn't been a lot of hasn't been a lot of money in, in coaching females. So I'm not sure that women have got the best coaches. Um, that's changing now in, in a big way because there's a, a pathway and opportunity for coaches. Um, so I think. At times we've tended to, with game knowledge, it's just teaching the kick and mark, and that's okay. You know, let's just let's just do that. If we just teach the kick and mark, they can go out there and they can have fun, and that's what we're going to judge them on. And I reckon that's been a little bit of the mentality. So when we talk about composure, um, when they get a footy in their hand, their ability to stop, assess the situation, and pick the right option the right decision isn't quite uh, where it will be for a, a young male at the same age. Habits from other sports. So anyone notice any habits from other sports? <coughs> Sorry? You can turn back inside for soccer. Yeah, okay, yeah. Turn back inside, what else? I like you kick it off the ground, it's soccer. So soccer, kick it off the ground, yep. Well, not, not used to getting the body there. Yeah, even though they don't allow to, they still want to. Yeah. So we have a we have a rugby player playing us who constantly just marks it and takes off. Yep. So yep. That composure. Yeah, that no, yeah. 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 I ran it on the weekend and so you've got about yep. you know, you've got until the umpire plays whistle. So what's the opposite end of what you're talking about there? There's another sport that yeah. Netball. Yeah. Netball is killing me. Yeah. <laughs> Netball is yeah. killing me. Why is Netball killing me? Because they stop. Because they get it and they stop. Yeah. And everything they do, they stop. So we're trying to fight habits. One of the things I, I think about the kicking, the great thing about the kicking is you're teaching from scratch, mm -hmm. so you don't have to get rid of bad habits. So that's been great. The rate of development uh, to teach kicking um, has been really good, really quickly. About six, seven weeks to teach someone to kick. But when we're talking about getting rid of those habits from other sports, that's some of the downside of that. And getting girls to be fluid in their motion, continual movement, has been a challenge. So they get the ball and they want to stop. Hits the ground, they stop and they pick it up and they look around. We want to keep moving. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, and just again, the aggression and the, the I'm sorry. And every time that they miss a kick, sorry, or they tackle someone's floor, sorry. I've seen girls stop in the middle of the game to see if their opponents are right. 
Right? So that's that caring nature that they have. Um, it doesn't always work well with food. All right, so that's that's probably the differences I've noticed. Again, um, nothing there we can't overcome, and some of it, a lot of it is a real positive. You know that um, even when you talk about game knowledge stuff, uh, the head athlete I've got, she, she's really good because she's come from uh, running and track sports. Anything you tell her to do on a football field, she does. So one of the things that we do now when we defend, we try not to follow our man back if there's a free one there. Press up to the content. You try telling a guy, or say an 18 year old boy, who for uh, the last 12 years has played footy, his coach has told him, You must stay on your player. And if he did, if he came off his player, he was yelled at. You try telling him not to not to run back with his guy in towards the fence and come up to the next guy and leave his man free. It's very, very hard to change habits. And some of the Franks and Dolphin players took really two years to get them to come up and defend higher up the ground. Whereas our head death league, Straight away. First time it's like, yep, yeah, okay, sorry, guys, I'll get another school. So, some of these are real straight, um, particularly you know, the asking more questions, uh, the listing more, offer um, a, a much faster rate of development. Right, so we sort of talk about kicking now, and I raise this as my methodology uh, for a lot of these points of how do we go about improving the skill level, how do we get about getting better and how I've gone about um, uh, fixing some of the issues. So this is just one element, so just look at the kicking. So on the first picture here, so what's what's the issue here? These are common uh, kicking issues with, with females. Sorry? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably it. What else? Two-handed drop. So we've seen that in a lot of, lot of females, or even even young men, so probably under eights, when we're coaching young boys, two hand a drop, we've got to get that out of them. So that's certainly, um, that's a real issue there. Uh, this one? Sorry, hold, yeah, holding under the ball. We've still got a lot of that, particularly when they get on the run. Uh, they might practice when we're doing our little kicking drills, might practice right, get on the run, all of a sudden, you see the ball's underneath the ball, which means you've got to lift it out like that, which means the ball goes up, spins that way, you kick it, they get these nice sort of 10 metre tall pads. So that's certainly an issue. Um, these two here, one, one's good, one's bad. So the first one, what's the issue here? Straight ball. Straight ball? Yeah, so what's the difference? It's one facing down, yeah. facing down. Yeah. So, Particularly when they, I'll show you with me. Particularly when they hold the ball high, as they go to lift it, it ends up flat. When you drop a flat foot, you all know what's going to happen when it hits our foot. So this one, the angle of that. So just having a look at how they're holding the footy and what angle is the footy going to be at when they let go of it. So we probably start. I mean, that's our starting point, isn't it? <coughs> all right. Um, just a couple of examples. Um, they're both they're pretty similar because this is, this girl is actually a, a hockey player and she's been working really hard on her kicking and you'll see this as it progresses. I've asked her to go back and repeat some of the mistakes she was making early on and some of the girls were making early on. And a lot of this stuff I discover along the way because uh, coaching at VFL for the last six years, no one's come to me and asked me how to kick before. You know, no one's said that to me since I coached my juniors uh, when my son was going through it. And one of the first sessions, a girl said to me, how do you kick the ball so low? And I had to stop and think about it, because I do. And I, didn't, I didn't know the answer to it, because I hadn't really thought about that before. So, um, so here I'm asking her to repeat some mistakes, and there's a lot of things that we discovered. And we look at the girl sometimes, we go, there's something wrong there, what's wrong? And then we discovered what it was as we went through the process. So the first one, first one, I'll go on that one. Nice and little further foot. Um, and then double hand drop. Yeah, so the just a couple, double hand drop. The next one can be very similar, but there's something else. Uh, look through that region there. Sorry. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And the foot on that one just stops. And a lot of girls, when they go to kick, they're there, they go back. So then the weight's coming backwards. There's no momentum through the kick. 
And that's a, that's a common problem we found. As soon as we sort of discovered that, we thought, what's wrong with that kick? What's going wrong? If the head was over, it all good, and we discovered that their back heel doesn't lift up. The back heel doesn't lift. So we had to address that. Once we did that, we were able to fix a lot of techniques. All right, so just looking at the, the two-handed drop here. All right, so what's the, what's the actual issue with a two-handed drop? Um, some do, some drop it really low. You find a lot with a two-handed drop actually hunch right over and they still drop it low. It's too far to the centre. Too, what do you mean too far to the centre? Well, you've got two hands. Yes. You're less likely to have it over your boot. Yeah, so, so they do. So when they do, when they do push it over their boot, what do they do? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, what happens here? So their shoulders turn. Yeah, so the shoulders turn to that side. So invariably, if you look at her there, that's straight up and down. The shoulders are actually pointing out here. So it's very hard for you to have a good kick. One, you're not going to get um, a good axis through on your leg because you're right over like that. So it's going to be very hard to get any distance on your kick. It's going to be very hard to be accurate. If you look on the other side, when you get that release hand to come off, what it does to your shoulders, it just opens your shoulders straight up at your target. You can see now where she's kicking, how her body's much more open. So is that a good, like, to teach young girls uh, about um, the leg and the shoulders being squared up, like is that something they can identify with? Yeah. You know, well? I think so. And I'm going to go through. I'll go through now exactly how we did that. So this is this is not these are both the action shots. One are old technique, and then one how she's kicking now. And this is, is absolutely vital. I think the earlier you can get that hand off the ball, the better off. If they get to five, six years of playing and they're still doing it, it's very, very hard to change. Um, we spoke about the heptathlete. She now, she's one of our better kids on the run and better kids over short distance than the other girls because she's learned from scratch. The girls that came to the club that with a two-handed drop and were trying to adjust, it's taken a lot, lot longer. And it's very hard to break that habit. So I think it's one of the most important things you can do for the kicking is get that hand off the ball, get that drop one hand, open up your shoulders. All right, so from there, um, this is the drill we do, and I think I've got sound on this one. So this one requires three, a couple of things. One, you've got to hold the ball correctly. If you hold the ball wrong in this drill, the ball's going to fall out of your hands. So first off, you've got to hold the ball correctly. So I'll show you how it goes. I call this, this is my ugly voice. <coughs> So that's our starting point. So one with the leg, two hand off, kick. All right, so they have to do a net off. Now if you, you imagine the ball, if you try and hold it where they hold it up here, the ball's just gonna drop. But it makes them hold the ball, remember this again, makes them hold the ball upright. If I play it in. So once they take this hand off, you've gotta be able to hold the ball there. Right, so it's getting them in good habits. See how she's popped her hand though? Yeah. She's having a lot of trouble with Yeah, her. she's still, she, yeah, yeah, exactly right. So for me, it's about, with the ball, it's trying to, because their hands, because they can't grip it, it's trying to get the It's hand. almost, it's changed the fours, dude. Sorry? Because we've changed the four. It's yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're having a lot of trouble with the ball. Yeah, the ball. So if you try and get them to, instead of holding on the side, Try and get it more around the front so it sort of sits in there rather than side there and go like that. But generally when you when you get into the full motion, you should be able to hold on the side anyway because the movement of the hand is going to keep in that spot. But it's about breaking it down like this and getting them to, to practice this. Alright. The next point after that, we want to get this ball drop right. So the next point is to we'll come out here, is to hold the foot in. Now, this time we want to take the hand off and want to step at the same time, but we always want to get the ball drop right. So it's just, and letting the ball fall. And where should the ball end, land? If you drop it on the ground, where's the ball going to land? On its nose. Sorry? On its nose. Yeah, on the point. It's going to land on the point. And that's what, that's what we want. So, and that's just getting them to start coming forward. Uh, 
get the hand off and start to get it going at one time. So they'll practice that, getting that. And then it's about just putting it together. You can see now she's starting to get momentum through the kick. You can see that back heel comes up. Yeah. That's what we want to see. That, feels, that starts to get those hips going through the target. That's the most important thing, other than the hand coming off, it's hips through the target, moving through that way. Um, and that's not a, probably a natural thing in a lot of female footballers, getting going to the target. The last point of what we do then, um, and I stole this from someone else who gave me this idea, and I think it's a great idea. Once we sort of got into that stage, we started saying, for 10 minutes before every trainer, you got to keep the tennis balls. Now, what's, why would we go tennis balls? It's a little bit easier. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you've got to get it exactly right on your foot, no? you've got to, otherwise it goes all off the place. And you can only drop it one hand. It's very hard to hold a tennis ball with two hands and drop like that. So it's it's getting that and they can do that nicely. So we've got here just doing a few, and they'll just do this before training. And, and this girl, um, she's come so far from never playing football before to now she kicks pretty good. Game sometimes can, under pressure can struggle a little bit. Um, but just worked so hard on her skills. But now she's been in our best players in the first two weeks. I mean, is that, is that the tennis ball something that you would do with boys? Uh, you probably should, yeah. yeah. No, well, I'm yeah. just trying to now practice with you, you know, so, yeah. and um, a couple of boys, like, you know, no. like, not so well. Yeah, absolutely, like, we're not, I'm discovering these things now, but I haven't coached under eights, but if I was going to start it, that's what I'd do. Yeah, no, and I've yeah. been to a couple. Yeah. And these older guys, like, yeah. Older guys tend to have those yeah. opinions, so there's a lot of. We listen to older guys, we still wouldn't kick across goals, we never kick backwards, we never do half the things we're doing. But, um, no. I think that's a great idea for guys as well. Um, hopefully, if you get it all right, I've just chucked in um, a bit of a clip from the first game. Yeah, she is playing her first game of footy. Kick didn't quite get it right, but she's hit a target and hit the skipper coming back in board. So, you know, that, if that kick there is the first kick in, in the game, that's the result of six months of her working extremely hard, gets to play in Skilled Stadium, um, going around on her right foot, gets blocked off, comes back inside, hits the target uh, 15, 20 metres away. It's a real tough kick for anyone. Uh, really, really, really proud of her to hit that option. I think I watched that game. It was lost by a lot, didn't it? Yeah, we did. It was 24 inside 50, so 28. Yeah, we just, just didn't score. We struggle. And I think the thing I'm trying to explain to people with women for this, um, Geelong had five or six of their goals dribble over the line. And with women's footy, generally one team is good enough to get it all the way, and one team is good enough to get it almost. Yeah. So you tend to have these 8 nothing, 10 2 scores when a lot of times it's not that big a golf between them. Uh, I've seen a few scores in the last couple of weeks that were really worrying, 250 to zero or something. They did do something about that. We can't, it's going to go forward, we, we can't have those scores. So. All right, so my five tips for Coach Wynn, and these are just my tips. We might have something different if we had to add to it, but my five, five tips. Don't set low expectations. Um, if I have one more friend associate say to me, don't worry about teaching game plans, just keep teaching how to kick, I'll smash them. Right. There's no reason, and everything, all that I've learned over the last five months, that every bit capable of taking on the game plan. Um, I don't want, sort of want to see a world where in local footy we're not referring to girls who can kick and mark as guns. You know, let's set the bar high. We've, we've got an elite program now, let's set the bar high. Like, let, let's, let's go through these development. Stages. Let's let's um, open the new ideas. Let's teach you new things. Don't set low expectations. If we keep setting the bar here, that's what we're going to achieve. Yeah. So let's set the bar high. It's not about yelling and screaming or demanding. Let's set the bar high on, on the female sports. Two, don't dumb it down. Right? As I said, they're more than capable. And 
And what is is more capable than guys are taking on a game plan. So don't dumb it down to them. Um, whatever you teach guys at the same age, they'll learn that. Now, they might have the skill level to execute it all the time, but I think it's important for their development that they learn these things. With, with game plans, um, I think it actually helps the skill, skill level. So we've got our, our footy field. And we've got a girl with a ball here, and she's got 18 people through this area here. Right? And we've got one free one right in the middle, and we're saying, you need to hit that one exactly. How, how hard a kick is that? And how much pressure is I need to hit that kick? And so we can do all the skill training you want, but if she's got to hit that every time, she's going to run into about 10%, I reckon. But if we teach good game plans, and we spread all over the field, and we can open it right up, and all of a sudden she's got one in there, and she's got this much space around her, she can hit that. That's a real easy kick. You know, we can, we can do that, that's doable. She might hit to start with five out of 10, but then it'll be six or seven out of 10. We need to give good options that they can, they can kick to. So the better your game plan, the more you teach them that, the, the easier those skills become. I don't know many AFL footballers that if we don't teach them anything, they can hit all those kicks. And the key to, you know, even uh, most AFL clubs look at a Hawthorne, they say, oh, what amazing kicks Hawthorne are. It's what the other guys around the kick doing is the important thing that makes them look good. So don't dumb anything down. Um, as I spoke about before, with the rate of injury, uh, the more um, <coughs> chances ACL, I think prehab is really, really important. So I'm not a prehab expert, um, but I've listened to a couple of talks where they spoke about that, using the rollers, making sure on those. Um, our fitness uh, strength and conditioning um, lady um, does an excellent job of all the run-throughs and, and strength stuff through the core. Um, so I think that's ultra important going forward. Uh, remember you're a role model. Um, and I'll probably aim this towards, more towards the guys. Um, I remember when I first started doing this, um, it sort of dawned on me that the way, I'm trying to put this correctly, um, how I speak to the females and the young females in my team, they will say that's acceptable going forward. So while we might raise our voice and swear occasionally, and go, we don't want to do it, we might get angry and yell, I don't think that's a good example to send the young females to be yelling. Because if we do that, we're normalising it. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to normalise that a male my age is yelling and screaming and standing out the top of the female. So I think how we address uh, women is ultra important. If you're honest with them, um, that can be just as, as powerful. Uh, you can be stern, you can have high expectations, but I think that yelling and screaming, I've been out to a couple of local games lately and I've seen, heard a coach carrying on and yelling and screaming. And I, just, I, don't, me, I, I don't think that's a good look. And I don't think that does anything going forward uh, for women's footy. And lastly, think big picture. It's about women's football. So again, a couple of experiences I've had going to local, um, still people trying to clutch on. It's about the coach, it's not about the progress, it's not about the game. Um, it's an unbelievable opportunity for women out there now to progress through the system. With that though comes some pathway issues. Right? So girls will be invited to VFL clubs and then all of a sudden they'll be dropping back in your club and that may mean that someone has to miss out. But that's all an important part of the pathway process. So if we want these girls to go on and succeed, which hopefully every club is your purpose as a, as a local club, is to harness and develop your local area and work for your community, you want these girls to go on and succeed. And if there's a chance of doing that, we need to promote that. We need to be thinking about the big picture and what's, what's now an opportunity for, for young women. Because uh, these young women will go on to be the role models uh, of the next generation of girls. I think the clubs that foster that best and understand that best will be the most successful. And so what's happening in a lot of clubs at the moment, it's like they're really resistant of, of there being a VFL and an AFL. They're not really understanding what men have understood for a while in the way that their pathway programs are set up. We all accept that young kids will go off to VFL and then they might not get a game there and they'll come back and we, we know that yet they get they play the ones and 
Fortunately, some kid drops out. That's just part of the system for, for the male footy. That probably not, hasn't been a part of female footy for a while. So there's going to be some teething issues. But I think we just need to think about the big picture um, because when there's 16 AFL women's sides, um, that's when this is a success. When there's women coaching those sides, that's when it's success. So I just implore everyone, think about the big picture, think about the players and their development first. And that's about it for me. Any questions? Just one. Um, how much I get two hours of the girls train an hour a night. Monday nights we do a bit of rehab stuff because they play Sundays. Um, trying to educate them in game plans and stuff like that. Probably yeah. harder than girls. 18 and under. 18 and under. So they're probably ranging like 14 to 18. Yeah, so like 14. Yeah, a lot of 14s. Um, some 15 and 16s. Um, a few of the girls have been involved with you for a while already. So yeah. it's easy to use them as examples. Yeah. Trying to sort of get them you know, sort of educated already. Yeah. But um, trying to sort of get game plan situations in with the younger girls. Yeah. They're not in the understanding of that. Yeah. So being on the, the short time I have, what's the best way you think they need to direct that? Okay, so with with um and with learning, um it's four different or three three particular ways of learning. Yeah. Audio, visual and kinesthetic, so doing. So try and mix up how you're gonna do that. There's probably some opportunities there to do some game plan stuff through Facebook or something like that. Yeah. I just had a look at my phone tonight before I came in. One of my coaches sent out a video clip the weekend's game and asked some questions. The girls got to get back to him. So I think it's a re- we can use technology there to do some offline as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Always encourage you to use defenders in pretty much every drill you do. Yeah. Right? Just if, if they're not getting it, reduce the defenders down. But always have something in there with some defenders. So. Um, Breaking game plan is really down small. I still do that at level. We do a lot of rotations. So if I do a drill, it won't go more than eight minutes. You, you, have you got any assistance? Uh, yeah, but it's been saying sort of there, game day. But, um, yeah. but breaking it down into smaller areas, is, which is good. Usually at training drills, yeah. it's always two or three or three. You know, it's always that yeah. sort of um, competency. Yeah. Um, and usually I get involved with that so they can whack me. That sort of becomes yeah. fun, um, but of course, bringing out game drills. Yeah, that would be more of what I need to keep going with. So even just yeah, I, lots of games, and so we set up a square and try this one. How many girls you got? About, yeah, about fifteen yeah. to train. Oh, yeah, be lucky. Like, uh, maybe ten, twelve. So, so get twelve, right? Four v four v four. Get if you got a couple of different types of bibs, right? Let's say green on there, green on there, and whatever they're normally wearing here, so colours. Right, the start them as the defenders, those two team up, just moving the ball around. Alright? Um, if they turn it over, whoever turns it over, whichever team turns it over, they're in defenders. Right, so you start off with say, okay, it's a mark, if you want to be composed, go back off the mark, fight off, there should be plenty there. Te- that'll teach your girls to spread around, make this area as big as possible. Yeah. Then you can introduce, okay, once they get good at that, to start with, they're like, you know, they might do two or three, and they start getting up to 10, 9 plus, it starts becoming easier. Say, so, all right, now every time you get it, it's now play on. So you have to play on every time. So now it becomes harder, you can keep increasing it. Then from there, you can then go into a same size and go, you know, 10 v 7. Makes it harder again. Yeah. So they're, they're continuously learning to get better. You can take the stuff out of the ground. And so when you're in defense, remember that drill we did, we have to make it big. Right, we've got, we're going to have an advantage here. You have to be composed. And, look. and these are the sort of little drills I, I still do now. Yeah. And this is how I find out educating some girls who probably didn't have much of this uh, in, into girls playing VFL footy now doing it quite well. But even the other night, we were having trouble with it. You know, everyone going to the ball and tackle and no one around the outside. Yeah, so yeah. we just invented a little drill about that. It's just, you know, it's just about that actual contest and then spreading around that contest and chaining it out. It's just about breaking it down. And it takes time. It takes oh, time. Yeah. They don't need to. You know, they don't have to have super game plans at the moment. But I think they need to have some sort of understanding that how we want to play, how we want to move the ball, what options you got available, and and sort of get away from that. Just get it, kick it down the line, get it, kick it down the line. I don't think that suits anyone. And what we want to do, I think, in junior footy, is bring everyone into the game. And, and it should be, a, you know, I just watch junior footy and people are lauded for the wrong reasons. 
You know, like, he's a superstar. He took seven bounces. He went down the wing, kicked the goal. He's yeah. this hero of the club. What we should be talking about is that kid, how he brought four others into the game. Yeah. And that everyone succeeds when we do that. And as a coach, it's all about behaviour, and you just got to talk about the right behaviours. Johnny, you're a star player, and the way you handled him, you brought your teammate in the game. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. I think that's the starting point for me. That's why I'm very careful, and I have over the weekend go and get quite goals, but still not being on the wall. No, it's just that the one with Shepard and the other wing, you know, it's sort of just those little things. Yeah. So we talk about behaviours, good and bad, yeah. not making it personal, it's the way to go. Yeah, it is. Yeah. No, that's good. You used to be using the same language with the girls that you were with the boys? Yep. And they completely understand yep. it? Yep. You just can explain it to them once they get it. Yeah. It's funny, I was out, um, we went out, we played after the senior men's VFL, and, um, a couple of girls out there listening at half a three quarter time, or half a quarter time, and they listen to Coach Big and he goes, He's still in your game plan. So <laughs> it's the exact same game plan. There's no difference. We don't, I'm not, as I said to him from day one, I'm not dumbing anything down. You're going to get the same game plan boxing against, you're to get the same game plan slightly modified that Hawthorne gets, and you've got to understand what your group is and what they can do. But yeah, it's first rate, they understand it fine. No problems out there. Executing it, can't always do that, they can certainly understand it. I, uh, I posed a question earlier to Lee at side, <coughs> just about uh, tackling yeah. and intensity of tackling. Yeah. The girls. I mean, how hard is too hard, or is there? Um, is there? It's a, nah. I, I understand there's rules, and they have to tackle. Uh, it showed a clip actually. Uh, legally. <coughs> uh, <laughs> just. Uh, but, but you know, we've had a few. Uh, Concussions and things, but the tackles and the girls tend not to. If they are getting tackled, they do end up being played out. <coughs> they don't sort of fall up to protect themselves. Yeah. Sort of so I think that teaching them, teaching them how to take the tackle yeah. um, and teaching them how to tackle properly is an issue. Yeah. Um, the thing I've probably noticed with our girls is they're very, I, I say you're very armsy, yeah. uh, very armsy with tackles, trying to tackle here. Yeah. Getting them to understand the strength of your body's not your arms, it's through your core. Get in low, the drive their shoulder. Um, we've certainly done tackling technique work, um, you know, try and keep them on the 45, step into the tackle, grab on an arm. If you can teach them that, hopefully, we don't have the same sort of head clashes. I was going to show a video, like, I just remembered I took it off my thing out. We had a girl last week that ran full pace, and another girl, she was picking up the ball, she came up, and now we went straight into her, tackled her, and then rolled her. And the two bodies were uh, collided. One of the toughest things I've seen on a field. Like most guys, I know, would turn and just bite the person. But she just went straight in, tackled her, brought it around. It was amazing. So, um, yeah, the girls I've got can certainly handle it. Um, I think if we teach better techniques, that will stop them getting hurt. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah.